morning. Today we're going to be talking about uh, one of the top fruits for Orange County, one of the ones that's actually worth growing. Uh, and probably our most valuable tree, plus perhaps the most difficult fruit tree to grow. Uh, and it's not your fault because the regular commercial suppliers are actually done. The retail suppliers of avocado trees don't put them in the right dirt, so they tend to, you know, they all, if you go to any other nursery, they'll warn you, don't water this too much. It's going to rot out, because that's the main problem with avocados, is they rot. Well, the main reason they rot is because the soil the growers grow them in is ground up trees. It's compost. And that alone usually makes plants rot. And avocados are just a little more prone to that. But, you know, there's no tree that likes to be growing in ground up wood. We do have a class on that coming up in probably about a month, month and a half. But, uh, so we grow the avocado, most of the avocados we're selling right now, we've grown in our own soil. Uh, no compost in it. So, uh, avocados do come from uh, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. There's three races that, uh, there's one species, per se, uh, Americana, but there's three distinct races, the Mexican ones, the Guatemalan ones, and the ones from the West Indies. Now, if you go to Florida, uh, the ones that do best in that climate there, where it's 90 degrees, 90% 90 humidity, rain all summer, the West Indies variety does best there. Now, we don't grow them here, even though they're real impressive looking. If you go to stores in Florida, you'll see avocados like this. Uh, a lot of hollowness in the center, a big seed also, and they promote theirs as being the slim avocados because they have a very low oil content. Uh, that's not what we like. We like the higher oil content. And, you know, it's interesting over the years, they used to say, well, well higher oil content makes you fat. Well, now it seems like it's the opposite now. The higher the oil content, the less fatting, fat creating doesn't create fat in your body, the more carbohydrates is the problem. So now the, uh, you know, the, they can't promote it that way at, at the moment as much as they used to. But anyway, the California avocados come mainly from the highlands of Guatemala and Mexico. So they're used to a little drier air, uh, more our climate. Now, 30 years ago, it wasn't as easy to grow avocados because we actually had winters. Uh, and a lot of the avocados bloom starting in December. And when it's cold in December and they're blooming, you don't get much fruit. You don't get any bee activity, you don't get much fruit. So we had a harder time getting a lot of the varieties that bloomed early, like Fortin Pinkerton, to make anything at all. Nowadays, we seem to get summer and winter. And the avocado production on the trees has really increased. So that's really helped us out a lot. Um, So on avocados, and they've always been, we've always considered them to be kind of light producers. Because they'll, you know, in the orchards, what they've noticed is that the average avocado tree, which may be about 15 foot tall and 12 foot wide, or something around that size, makes about a million flowers per year, generally in the spring. And normally they get 100 to 110 fruits per tree off of a million flowers, that's not very good. <laughs> uh, now, Valencia orange is one out of 10, 10%. Uh, Navy orange is one out of 50, 2%. But avocados is one out of every 10,000 flowers. That's pretty bad. Now, the university, some of the researchers at University of Riverside uh, were s s kind of thinking, well, maybe it's the bees that don't like the flowers. Avocados are known to have nectar that's not as sweet as citrus. So one of the worst things that happen in your yard is you have an orange tree blooming next to your avocado tree. The bees just head over to the orange tree. They have much sweeter nectar, they'd rather go over there. So that's been the problem, is, it, is the avocado, bees don't like the avocados as much. So this one researcher said, well, let's try it 
hand pollinating the avocado tree. See how well I do. So with the bees, it's an average of a little over 100. When he hand pollinated the avocado tree, he got 700 food on the tree. Now, when I first read that, I thought, boy, that might be worth doing. But then you think about it, he has to do uh, 100, 1 million flowers, that's not what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, so last summer, a year ago, in my backyard I had four avocado trees. Pretty big trees. And in June we're looking at him going, there's only one food on these four trees, that's terrible. That's really bad, but I've got like 10 citrus in my yard. So that's the problem. So we were looking over the internet and saw this video on a plan about pollinating avocados better. And two different YouTube videos, two different people, two different parts of the country, they're saying the same thing. Make the flowers more attractive. So when they're blooming, and again, generally the blooming is for about two to three months, uh, starting usually in winter, ending sometime in spring, um, spray the flowers with honey. And suddenly the avocado becomes more attractive than anything else in your garden. So they are doing, uh, and both of them the same thing, 25% honey, 75% water. And spritzing the flowers when they bloom. Now the flowers, generally on the ends of the branches on a mature tree, clusters are tiny flowers about a quarter inch or less in size but each cluster might have 200, 300 flowers on it. So it's kind of easy to tell, they kind of star like when they open up. And they just said, spray this, you're gonna get a little spritzer bottle and spray it on your flowers. Now in June of last year, I had like one cluster of flowers left on my tree. I uh, counted there were like 10. So I got the honey water out, I got my little honey in the spritzer bottle and spritzed that one flower blossom. So I hadn't seen any bees really on the trees at all. And the next morning I go out there and there's five bees on that cluster. I'm going, well, this is interesting. There's actually bees in the avocado tree. So out of that cluster of ten flowers, we got five fruits. And so we started telling our customers about it. And this year they, a lot of them tried it and they said that thing works. Because they would have to thin out the avocados. Now instead of not having enough, there's too many forming. Uh, the guys who are doing this, Showed pictures, you know, that it was like a swarm of bees on each cluster the entire day, and when, by the time they were done with it, it looked like a cluster of grapes forming. Just hordes of fruit. So uh, that seems to be the trick. Whenever they're blooming, spritz them with honey water, and the bees will find them. Bees will, unless it's raining or unless it's 40 degrees out there, the bees will find it. So. so and because of that, now we think the trees won't have to grow big. So the University of California had been talking about size and avocados, and they had, quote, uh, an avocado they called Gwen, which they considered a dwarf, because it never seemed to break 10 feet. Well, they had suspicions about the Gwen. Gwen was a real heavy producer, and it was staying small, but they didn't think it was really a dwarf. So what they did was, I guess because it grew fast when it was young, but what they did is they cut off all the flower clusters on it for five years and all the trees broke 20 feet. Yeah. So it turns out if they're producing heavy, they don't grow. And one fruit on a plant on an avocado is probably worth about two or three feet of growth. There's some empty chairs right over here. Um, so if, you, if your tree is loaded every year, you won't get much growth on it. And so the Gwen trees load, tend to load up every year. The hash trees, which are rated at you know, large trees, the, according to the research results from the University of California, they get one heavy crop every three years. And that's the reason they grow big. Two years they grow, three feet a year, and the third year they don't, they've got a crop. And part of that's due to, well, it, it's not, it's better now, right now because of our warm winters, but it used to be uh, the, the hass was going February, March, April, and most trees February, March, April was the middle of winter. It was too cold, the bees weren't out there, no fruit set. Uh, 2008 was a good example of that. I was talking to some orchard growers. That year, a lot of the, we remember the crepe myrtle trees did not wake up till June that year. It was so cool in the spring. And our 
Chicago managers I talked to said, we had no food set this year, 2008, in that spring, because it was just cold. Uh, so, or cool, I mean, we don't get cold here, we get cool. So, <coughs> so anyway, um, right now the trees are producing better just because the winters are warmer, and if you get the fruit to set heavy, you won't have to worry about having trees that are too big. Because that seems to be the key. Get them, keep them production. Now, there's no problem just trimming them. So I've talked to orchard guys and said, yeah, we keep our trees below 12 feet. We don't want to be able to have to climb a ladder. In the old days, they had the big, you know, forte and half out the towers. They let them reach about 20, 25 foot, and then they would stump them. They would just cut them down to a four foot stump in winter. So they lose one year crop. By the next winter, that tree was about eight by eight again, and ready to bloom and fruit and make food again. So they lost a year doing that. Now they stumped a lot of avocado orchards 2013, 2014. In fact, I did mine in 2014 during the drought. They couldn't get enough water to make their trees happy anyway, so they said, well, let's stump them. We can save half of your water. So when you stump an avocado tree, it doesn't usually start. I used to stump mine in March that year, 2014, and it didn't show any growth until June. But from June through December, it grew about eight foot, uh, six foot, mm -hmm. and it bloomed the next year. So uh, you can save about a half year of watering if you stump them, and that was the standard procedure back in the old days. Nowadays, it's just trim every winter if they get them too tall, keep them small, don't lose a year of crop. Are you going to talk about trimming a little bit more later, or is that enough? Well, there's no real rules on that. Um, you can prune them any time of year. Uh, generally, on uh, on evergreen fruit trees like the avocados, if you cut below the last leaf on the branch, that branch probably won't fruit the next year. If you leave some leaves on the branch you're pruning, yeah, you can still make a crop the next year. But what about like a? I've got a 35 foot probably 40, 45 year old mature orchid. You can stump it if you want. Well, I don't want to. <laughs> but, you know, if I cut 10 feet off of it, uh, that's not going to hurt it too much. Then. In fact, it would probably make it happier. Or? Yeah, and you can do it right now. The main thing about pruning avocados in the summer is that they do sunburn without the foliage protection. So that generally, unless it's 113 degrees like three weeks ago, the leaves don't burn. It's generally the stems that can burn if the leaves aren't shading. So I did bring a sample of a tree here that got burnt two ways. So this tree got sunburned on this branch. You see it brown right here. It turned brown, so that's sunburned. It also got leaves that just fried in that heat because this was standing over the sidewalk. So that's just too hot. I didn't think about that. But, uh, yeah, so they, the leaf isn't shading the branch. Here's another example on the end of this branch where the leaves weren't covering while well, that branch turned pretty dark brown where it normally is green until it gets bark forming after about three or four years. Um, so when you prune a tree, you just take a look and see, okay, this wood's exposed now, let's fly wash it. We have our fly washes that we sell. Now, truthfully, you don't have to buy this expensive stuff. You can go down to a store and get uh, light colored latex paint that's water based paint. You can cut it in half with water. It's, it's dark enough or just use a full strength and just paint the stems white or any light color. These happen to be uh, a local manufacturer that actually put uh, essential oils in here too. So it not only acts as a sunburn repellent, it acts as an insect repellent and as a rodent repellent. So it, it does double duty that way. Now, if your tree is healthy, generally it can take temperatures to about 100 degrees without any burning. Um, sometimes in the winter, they'll burn because the sun's coming at a different angle. It's lower in the sky. Uh, so occasionally you get sunburn in the winter from things that are not normally exposed. But uh, and if, it's, if we have a 
uh, and 90 degree heading in January, which we've had lately. So you have to watch <coughs> that. But generally in the summer, if the tree's healthy, it doesn't burn unless it's about 100 degrees. Um, we had gotten our tree some broconers. This is Broca. This is their little label here. But, and they're the largest supplier of commercial orchard trees in California. And the trees we got from the retail suppliers would burn at about 90. When we got Brokaw trees, and we noticed we never saw them burn up until 2010 when it hit 112. <laughs> My backyard, they just burned. So we know there's a limit. But if they're healthier, they don't burn as easily. You get them from the, the better growers, and they are down there. They're more burn resistant. They got better, apparently, circulation in them so that they can stay cooler. Well, the heat. You know, the high temperatures make them drop fruit? Well, it burnt them. It, it, the fruit, if it burns up, then, it, it, then it's going to drop them. I mean, the leaves are a little bit damaged, but I mean, there's like a hundred yeah. Well, generally, when the temperatures get hot, they do drop a lot of fruit. So they say if the fruits on avocados, whatever sets in the spring, if it's still there by September, it's usually going to be a little mature. But uh, summer is when they usually lose a lot of food. And they said a lot of the food that drops off, you cut it open, there's no pit in there. It, it dropped because there was no seed. It didn't get pollinated properly. So, yeah. Once the branch is burned, do you leave it anyway, or do you need to get rid of it? Well, you leave it and see what happens. Some branches will make it, some branches won't. Mm -hmm. So the burning does cut off, cut off the circulation in that branch. Uh, I've had branches you know, fairly thick branches, say as thick as my fingers, on big trees burn and just break off. Or they burn, like two days later, they just broke off. Mm -hmm. It's so bad. <laughs> so, uh, um, so lots, and a lot of times if your trunk burns, then they'll grow a new trunk. And the reason why Brokaw has their, has this cardboard on the trunk, so that this part of the tree at least won't burn, so if, if the grower doesn't the whitewash your trees, the entire top may be gone. The tree will regrow from what's underneath the cardboard here. And that'll say that that's why they do that, just to make sure they don't lose the whole tree if they don't whitewash. When I whitewash the tree, what, what do I actually put? Where do I put it? Anything that's not a leaf. Okay. Can burn. Like the whole tree? Because we've got a pretty big tree. Right. But if, if the sun can't touch it, you don't, you know, the north side of the tree, you don't worry about that. Okay. It's whatever the sun can touch. It can burn. Now, as the tree gets bigger, the danger of sun burning is gets smaller and smaller because most of the tree protects itself. But young trees definitely can lose whole tree. But, but even big trees still burn. You know, they certainly burn good this year. So, I mean, my friend of mine has an orchard in uh, Tustin here. You look in their orchard, it's like they lost two-thirds of their crop. All the branches just burnt. It's just that that we had you know, June bloom up until the moment we had 114 degrees. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really prepared for that heat. Does it help to whitewash a sunburned branch or is it too late by then? Still helps. You know, it's nice to have some coverage on that branch so if it's still alive you can protect because the leaves can't anymore. Okay, um, now we're growing, we're selling, most of the trees we're selling are grafted seedlings. So what the grower does, what Brokaw did, did for us is they grew a seedling and they use Zutano seeds from a variety called Zutano, grow them for a year or so, then cut off the tops and graft the branch onto the tree we want. Uh, so ours that are $50 are all grafted seedlings. Now, seedlings will fruit. So any seed you plant will make fruit eventually. It may take a long time. Uh, one seedling I grew, and probably the only one I'll ever grow, because <laughs> it takes, mine took seven or eight years to get its first blooms, and then two years later it made its first fruit. And the fruit came out quite similar to its parents. So your, the seeds are like your kids, same thing. They're zygotic, they're, genetically mixed, whatever the other parent was, they get mixed with that. So um, they're going to be similar, but not quite the same. Now, I've talked to a customer who planted 
who has 13 trees, all from seeds. And he says, eight of his 13 are good enough for them to eat. Five of them are not. So your chance of getting a good plant are better than 50% in general. Now, like mine, uh, mine was fine. Uh, it wasn't as productive, but that only may only be because uh, babies tend to be non as, not as productive as their parents for quite a while. It takes them a long time to mature. Now, Brokaw, for most of their orchards, they do a, they have a different tree. So this particular tree here is one of their, quote, orchard trees. This is on a clonal rootstock. So that means all the roots on this tree are also genetically identical. Whereas seeds, seeding rootstocks, each seed is genetically different. So here you don't know. If you, if you grow a rootstock from seed, it may be the best roots in the world, it may be the worst roots in the world. You have no idea. Generally they're fine, but you know, if you're running an orchard and you've spent millions of dollars to create your orchard, you want to have some guarantee. It's better, it's better to know that every tree is really good. So they do what is called the clonal rootstock. So they and the way they find their best roots, they'll go, they've gone to orchards where all the trees died from root rot, you know, from real bad rains, the trees died, but one survived. So they take the rootstock of that tree, and it was a survivor tree, and they figure that one's better. So most of the uh, rootstocks that they use are from, quote, survivor trees, the trees that had genetically better roots in that orchard that withstood all the trees around them rotting out, and they survived. Now, they're going a different route. So the last you know, 50 years, 60 years they've been doing this, they've always chose the roots of the trees that survived the wet winter. But that's not, you know, that currently that's not our biggest problem. Surviving drought is our biggest problem. So now they're finding trees, or using trees that are surviving the drought. Totally the opposite. And from Israel, they've sent California rootstocks of trees that are better with, you know, drop conditions, salty soil, uh, things like that. It's totally opposite of what they've been doing in the past, because now our drought is more important than root rot. So I don't know if they'll have roots that go good both ways, but right now, uh, you know, most of these can handle the uh, overly wet winters better than they can the uh, dry summers. Now the way they make these, because next spring we'll have more of these. We had uh, two or three varieties this year. We sold out of those. These run a lot more. They're twice as expensive, essentially, to create those because they have to be grafted twice. So when they do these, so the regular seeds, you know, I got mentioned, they just grow the trees for a year, cut off the tops, splice in a branch of the tree you want, and that's it. When they do the clone rootstocks, they start the same way. That They like to start with seeds because the seeds are so big that they have a lot of energy. They can, they're can they like a nurse. They make the plant grow better. So this, so they have a tree like this one is on Toro King root. So there's a tree out there called Toro King. And what they do is they grow a seed first, graft on a branch of the Toro King onto the top of the seed. Uh, here we have the seed. They grow them in a skinny pot. It has roots at the top. They graft on the Toro King on top of that. So here we got a branch of the Toro King and it now is growing. So this tree is now called Toro King. But they have this real deep pot. And what they do with it is they put a metal ring above the graft that'll cut the roots that that trunk off as the tree grows. And they after this tree grows for a while they'll stick it in a dark greenhouse and what it'll do is start rooting out of the trunk. So they surround it with dirt and it roots out into this soil here. This part gets cut off by that metal ring. It loses the original seed after a while. And then they graft the top onto the tree that they want. In this case, it's having bacon avocado. And so the top is bacon. These roots are Toro Canyon. And the original seed is dead. So 
it takes them a bit longer to make those. They charge us almost twice as much uh, to create this than they do this as uh, grafted seedlings. Most homeowners, you know, grafted seedlings are what you get from any other store. It's fine. Uh, now and then you might run into a real weird, wacky one, but generally there's there's not much wrong with it. As long as they're healthy. Of course, I did mention the stuff you buy at other stores is not very good, not very healthy. So, okay, so we got these grafted liners in. They were in pots uh, in March or April that were about as thick as my thumb. So real tiny pots, just being able to hold this, the seed, really. And they're grafted. We put them in these three-gallon pots with our top pot potting soil and have grown them since then, some have grown, they're probably about this tall when we got them. So they've grown a, a good bit since we've got them in. They love this weather. I mean, now that, you know, uh, three weeks ago, all the tops of our trees just burnt right off. Just, it was terrible. I mean, we, we scheduled our classes about a month ahead, so we're going, okay, you know, this doesn't look good. But the weather, you know, didn't get much above 100 after that day. And they regrew really fast. I mean, this lost every leaf it had at the top of this branch. But it was in such good growing mode at that moment that it just regrew the top really quick. So we had some burning going on, but it was basically just because the leaves just couldn't handle the dry heat. So they just shriveled to a crisp. So we didn't get as much sun burning as we thought we would. I mean, on this particular plant, you can see, maybe see a little bit of burnt right on, there's a little bit of brown on this branch here where the sun got it, but not much evidence of sun burning. It just has a new set of leaves that's growing because all the old ones just shriveled up. Now, avocados uh, tend to put on a new growth spurt every season. So spring, they grow two or three feet. Summer, they grow another two or three feet. Fall. Every season, they seem to put on new growth spurt. Uh, some varieties, uh, some of the cultivars, I should say, tend to drop a whole their old leaves every time they put a new set on. So they're dropping a lot of leaves. Now, the main thing about avocado is they like those leaves on the ground below. They recycle all the nutrients, so don't take your leaves away. I mean, in the old days, they thought the dead leaves were causing, you know, can cause trouble. It's dead parts of yourself land on the ground. Well, in nature, they know now that plants drop the leaves for a certain reason, they want to recycle the nutrients to get fresh leaves going. So, um, now planting avocados, let's go over that. They, the, the thing about avocados that's different, they like lots of water. Now, again, if you go to most nurseries, they'll tell you, don't water this tree too much because it'll rot. He's bringing up a good point. Um, some of the leaves we've been discarding because where we are, a lot of salt and we didn't want to put that salt back in the soil. We figured that the tree is actually improving the soil over time, drawing the salt out, but putting the salt, the leaves back in would just keep recycling that salt, right? I don't know if that's significant, though. Yeah? Okay. I just leave the leaves. Okay. I don't, I don't, you know, they, when they get that tip, a lot of times it is from salt, but I don't know how much salt that. It has, it has the brown tip and then the white line between the brown and the green part of it. I can't see that being a significant amount of salt. There was an article on the internet that said that when you get this brown tip, it's because of the salts, but primarily the chlorine. And there's been more than 100 parts per million of chlorine. And here, it is 125, 150 higher. So they're saying, if you don't have chlorine in the water, the chlorine salts go down and they create this problem. So if you use water that's not chlorine, you don't feel just the brown tip anymore. I don't know. No, no. When we grow avocados ourselves, we don't see any brown tipping at all. We just don't. I don't. We think it's just if the roots are healthy, you don't get them. Um, unless you're in some real unusual condition where the salts are building up, where your soil is naturally very salty, or the ocean that sometimes happens, or if the drainage is real bad. But I don't know. When we're growing avocados in our soil, we don't see that. We don't have any brown tip. We don't notice it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, when we used to buy trees from the other growers, yeah, that was. And when we get plant from other growers, period, 
they're always brown tips. And we think that's just a root issue. The plant, the roots, plants, roots aren't very healthy, all the leaves tip, tip them. And that's, we think that's more of an issue with root health than it is with, you know, for years, uh, the problems with uh, maples. They would blame the Japanese maples brown chipping on, on salt. Uh, we got Japanese maples from Oregon and grown in the ground. We could have been pulled sun, never tip burnt. But everything we got growing in bark always tip burnt. So we think, yeah, that's root health. It's not uh, soil, it's not water, it's not anything else. It's just root health. So our take on it anyway. So anyway, um, when you grow avocados, it's because they're coming from a rainy climate, I mean, almost rainforest conditions. They need lots of water, but they don't want any standing water. So what they say to do is, when you dig your hole for your avocado tree, fill with water. If it rains in 30 minutes, you're good. Uh, if the water sits in that hole for more than a day, you might have some trouble. It's actually two days is the limit. Um, my last house I lived at, you did that, the water being there for weeks. It was just solid clay. And uh, so we, instead of growing them in the ground, we just grew them above ground. And that's one of the things they do now. Two ways to do this. The University of Ag uh, California Ag Agent told me there's no clay soil in California bad enough that if you mix 50 50 with sand, it'll break. So what he said to do is take your soil, mix it half with sand, making creating a large amount, so this is now half sand, half native soil, it will drain, plant your avocado tree in that, and you're good. Now my house, we couldn't even dig, that soil was so bad, I mean, uh, my friend is a, ge was a geologist in my neighborhood, he says, don't even try to dig your soil, we made that really solid, because we're at the edge of a 10 foot drop off to the next house, and he says, we pack that with two foot of clay, don't even try to dig it. We, you know, they had all their heavy equipment just roll on it. And they just said, there's just no way. So when we started digging there, we said, yeah, there's no way we can do this. So what we did is we essentially set the root ball of the avocado tree, which is about 15 inches tall, on the ground and front it with sandy dirt. About 10 foot wide mound of sandy dirt. That was two pickup loads of dirt in our backyard uh, that was perfectly sandy soil, not compost, you know, buy anything called topsoil, that kills avocados in a couple of weeks. It's called topsoil. But it's just sandy dirt or pure sand will work too. Uh, Surround them with that, make a hill. Uh, sand doesn't move with water. So we had this hill for like 15 years, never moved an inch with the rain or the irrigation water. I mean, if you go to a beach, you know how hard it is for waves to move sand. Uh, rain doesn't do it at all. The irrigation water doesn't move sand. So that hill held up, even without much mulch cover on it at times. Uh, so we put our avocados on that, totally above ground level, water them thoroughly. Um, one of my trees on the Toro Canyon stock grew uh, about 10 feet the first year. I mean, it just took off. Likes that condition. Now, I will have to admit, though, at the edge of my yard where there was that 10 foot drop off, block wall, we put an avocado tree, just essentially this same one here, in a hole three foot from the edge of the property. So the drainage, even though it was clay here, it was right next to a 10 foot drop off. That tree grew five feet the first year. I was happy with that. I thought, you know, I was just putting that one in there for a foot of pollinator, and it just became my best avocado tree, sitting in the clay soil, but at the edge of a drop off. Did quite well. So. so, lots of water, good drainage. Uh, Brokaw will tell you on it if you plant one of their trees. Now, this is probably a year older than what they can sell. Uh, we got this uh, earlier this year. They, they were about to throw them away. We took them because uh, they're getting a little big for their pots. But they'll tell their, their orchards one gallon of water per day the first summer. Four gallons of water per day the second summer, 15 gallons of water a day the third. By the third summer, they expect this to be about eight by eight, or maybe even a little larger. So 15 gallons a day. Full-grown avocado, you figure, you know, uh, 
30, 40, 50 gallons of water per day. That's what they take. So that's agriculture. I mean, we have a lot of people in this area who say, well, we never water avocado trees. They're getting water somewhere. And probably the neighbor's yard. <laughs> <laughs> I would spread far and wide. I mean, avocado roots or any tree roots, really, within 20 years, they can be 100 foot long. So, uh, I've heard a lot of stuff about how to walk. We just moved into this house out of a mature tree, and um, a lot of things it had a bubbler on it that would water it every day with the sprinkler. But um, other people told me to shut it off and water it just once a week. Um, in farming, what they found out over the last couple of generations is the more frequently and lightly you water, the more efficient the water is. So, so I should the, turn the bubbler back on? Uh, heavy, infrequent watering is detrimental to the crops, detrimental to the water bill. Uh, and they thought that it might grow deeper root systems. But when they checked it, they found the exact opposite. So they did an orchard test in the University of California Davis where they water one side of the orchard with the same flood irrigation once a week, other side of the orchard daily light irrigation with micro sprinklers. When they dug the trees up after a year, they found that the micro sprinklers had made a significantly bigger root system than the deep and frequent watering. So all the theories that they tell you, all the reasons for deep watering are false, apparently, are not true. Well, I noticed the trees not, it didn't seem as good as when we moved in. Yeah. But I probably heard it. Since the roots spread so far, they can go anywhere. How do you know where to put your bubblers? And how do you just spray everything? Yeah, so if we have a winter rain, then the roots are, you know, if we have good rains, then the roots are everywhere. Uh, and so at that, in the middle of winter, that's when you say, okay, I'll water here from now on. And the roots will be there and they'll stay there. Um, if you sunny switch in the middle of summer, the roots can't figure it out. I, I had an orange tree once where I just watered with three drippers. And 15 years later when they dug up the tree, that's the only place I found any roots at all. <laughs> right below the three drippers. Everything else was empty. But they do say that in the winter, the roots will scramble out where they're getting good rainwater is falling too. Gotcha. Okay, so lots of water on your trees. Uh, they like a lot of leaf cover on, on the ground too, so the orchards no longer take away the dead leaves, they let them pile up. A friend of mine went down to Guatemala 20 years ago, he wanted to see how deep the leaves are underneath the wild avocado trees. He said he dug through five foot of leaves before he hit there. He couldn't believe how high they pile up underneath those things, so uh, five foot is okay. Now my yard, I never seem to get that many leaves, so whenever I prune to anything, my hedges, anything, I throw all their leaves underneath the trees too. See if I can get anywhere close to a foot thick. I mean, those leaves decompose really fast. It's like you always have to re recover them or add to that pile of dead stuff underneath them. Now, once they're big, they don't require that much fertilizer. But when they're young, you just want to feed them and get them growing. So, Brokaw tells you just you know a lawn fertilizer, a high nitrogen fertilizer, every season. Get that tree growing as fast as you can. So, if you plant an avocado tree. Something that's higher in the first number, 624 on this fruit tree one. 612 neem seed meal. Soft earth isn't quite as high, but it's not bad. 552. Five, uh, when we grow our avocados, we stick this awesome code in there, 15912. This is a chemical fertilizer, so those are organic. In the long haul, organics are better. Uh, short haul, this is just easier for us. This is a time release over six months. So you apply it once and then forget about it. Did yeah. you mention that second one, that neem, as part of? Uh, yeah, neem seed meal. This is described as neem seeds. Does, it, does that help the spider mites? No. No? You know, you have to keep neem seed oil does that. Yeah. yeah. This is the other part. This is after they take the oil out, this is what's left. Okay. I mean, a lot of the good fertilizer, organic fertilizers are seed meal. So they grind up cotton seeds, corn, I mean, you figure, yeah, the seeds of plants have all the minerals that plants need to grow. So the seed meals are really good for the plants. It's like baby food. If you're using 555, five, five, that's not good. Well, if it's organic, it's not bad. But if it's chemical, that's 555. Five, five, five. Yeah, it's not bad. You're putting on stuff you don't need. It's not going to hurt them. It won't help the grow. 
Right. Uh, the more knife, knife makes them grow. Once they're good, I would say once they're eight by eight, you can almost stop fertilizing, period. Now, the timing on fertilizer on a mature tree, they said, um, the research shows it's best to starve them while they're blooming. So feeding a plant is not actually feeding a plant. When you, feed, when you give a plant fertilizer, uh, you're giving it building material to grow, but the energy for that growth is stored in the tree. So you're taking the energy that the tree could use for making fruit and making leaves out of it. So they say with, with avocados anyway, they starve them all spring, fertilize them after the fruit's set, when the fruit's you know, a good inch, half inch, inch or so, then they start feeding them for the summer. Summer is the main growing period in avocados, apparently. So they feed them for the summer, starve them in the spring, if they feed them at all. There's a lot of trees out there don't much beans anymore. Um, there's a few pests that they can get. So there's, uh, on a few of our trees, uh, we had some caterpillars on them, little loopers eating the leaves. Uh, that doesn't happen too often, but Captain Jack's dead bug brew is an organic product. It has spinosadin, which is an ingredient found in rum, and kills any chewing pests. So if you get any caterpillars or any holes, um, there's a, a beetle that'll do this, nick the leaves from the edges, and it just gets, if you don't do anything, the, the nicks get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, and eventually you have a skeleton left. It takes them a long time to do that. Uh, this is all to take care of those. Um, snails can get up the tree too, so if you see big round holes in the leaves, that could be snails. Uh, the best way to prevent that is you go to an avocado orchard, you'll see that they have a copper band around each trunk. We sell, I think we sell copper tape. Um, but if you put a band of metal around the trunk, they don't seem to be well able to climb over that. Apparently, snails and slugs, their foot is a big naked muscle. So it kind of shorts them out and they try to climb over metal. So they do that in the orchard. There's one mite that came into California in the 1990s called a Persea mite. And what it is, a little spider mite on the leaves that would make these silvery circles, silver patches all along the veins. If it was bad enough, it would spread out over, over the entire leaf. And if it was real bad, the tree would drop all its leaves to get rid of the mites. It would just abort all the foliage. Um, now, this doesn't get as bad, so the Persea mite, what the University of California did is he went down to Mexico found the mite that eats this mite, so that you get Persea mites going through a neighborhood, and they also attack uh, camphor trees, so if you have big camphor trees in your neighborhood, about every five years, you'll see the Persea mites going through there, they'll get little spots in all their leaves, they'll shed a lot of leaves, but they never go bare because Right behind them is this good mite falling up behind them, eating the bad mites. So you mean that if you see this, unless it gets real bad, you probably don't have to treat it because the good and the bad mites are here now. But if you want to treat it, once you hit them once with some kind of mineral oil or neem seed oil, the oil just suffocates and kills them. One shot has always cleaned up our trees. We were battling this back in the 90s without the good mites around, and uh, we had to hit them with that. And, one shot would always clean them up. Each silvery patch, if you look at through a magnifying glass, is the little spider web. Underneath each spider web is a colony of little mites. So there's a lot of, you know, there can be thousands on one leaf, even on that leaf. Now, root rot can be a problem. If you get a tree from us, most likely you won't get root rot. You'll have, you know, lack of water issues, sunburn issues. But if you do get root rot, if you buy a tree from someone else and you just have little leaves at the tips of the branches, everything's getting real small and sparse. That's a sign of no roots, small leaves, uh, sparse growth, just new leaves at the tip, everything else falling off, branches dying, that'd be root rot. 
the University of California sent all the nurses letters 20 years ago saying that this garden foss, it used to be called agrifoss, but garden foss, mono and dipotassium salts of phosphorus acid. So this is, in many states, they label this, instead of this is labeled as a fungicide in California, in many states the U.S. label this as a fertilizer because it's potassium and phosphorus salts. But it's a very sol soluble form of phosphorus. They would inject this into almost dead avocado trees and bring it back to life. They said it really was amazing. So a lot of the uh, orchards will just put this in their irrigation water and use it as a once a month treatment for their avocado trees if they think they have root rot going on. But uh, this is used a lot in agriculture, uh, root rot on avocados, root rot on citrus. Uh, downy mildew on roses, downy mildew on onions, downy mildew on basil, downy mildew on impatiens. Uh, there's a lot of new diseases out there that this happens to treat well. And the nice thing about this, because it's more or less a fertilizer, they don't have any waiting time uh, that you have to wait before you eat your products because it's not a poison. Have you tried that with tomatoes? I have not. Uh, it's supposed to do late blight on tomatoes when it rains. Right. With all the drizzle in the spring, you get that brown spot and it's supposed to help with that. Okay, the other pest that's in the state now is, uh, now this, I call it polyphagus or, but they, when the experts roll it off the tongue, it sounds different. <laughs> That just means he eats a lot of different plants, but uh, polyphagus. But this is a weevil that came into California four years ago, a real tiny thing about it, so big. It's got a snout on one end, so it looks like a little elephant trunk on the front end of it. But this beetle has been going around attacking avocados, and it's carrying a fungus with them, which is, so it does something interesting. It bore, bursts into the trunk of the avocado, into a big branch, introduces the fungus, the larva can't eat the wood, but it can eat the fungus that eats the wood. And then it comes out of the trunk. The beetles make a lot of little, the emerging beetles make a lot more holes in the trunk and it messes the tree up. So when you see an avocado, and I saw one about a month ago in, in a customer's home, the area where the beetles are attacking it, the wood is like it's soaked or dark and it's oozing stuff. And you can tell the tree is sick right there. It's not normal looking, it's all oozing. There's little holes in it with little um, sawdust-like material coming out of the holes. So the cure for that is just cut it off, <laughs> let it regrow. So hopefully you don't get that tack near the base of your tree because then there's nothing left to grow back from. But um, this attacks trees that are under drought stress. And we have had, what, five years of drought up until last year. There was four or five years of drought there. So people, and if you weren't watering your trees enough, then this beetle was attacking your trees, entering this fungus. It wasn't necessarily killing the trees, but it was killing entire portions of the tree. So you get the cure is to cut that area out and let it regrow from the healthy area. And just keep your tree moisture, paint it, you know, for whitewash it, do all that, and it should grow back healthy. But that, this beetle has been attacking, now they've removed thousands and thousands and thousands of trees in Orange County it not only attacks uh, avocados, it, you know, it's going after the sycamores uh, in uh, all the parks and the campuses in the area. It's going after those. Uh, some of the oaks, quite a few different plants it's going after. But, you know, if it's, again, if it's well watered, no issues. Most people at home. Now, so the orchards are racing for the attack of this beetle but they said they haven't seen it at all. Apparently, because they water the orchards properly, this beetle has not attacked the orchards. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they think that this beetle is also uh, evolving to something else. As they said, it seems to be attacking different plants. So we'll see how it goes. You can apparently treat it with the systemic. Um, we have some sunburned areas that have kind of blistered, and then it gets like a white, it almost looks like bird poop on it. Yeah, that's crystallized sap coming out. So, is that a fungus, or? 
No, it's crystallized sap. So if you have a sunburn area, the beetles like to attack those areas because there's not much sap flow in the sunburned areas. So a beetle probably bored into it, but the sap came out and, and, and <coughs> kept it out of the hole it was uh -huh. trying to make. So that crystal, a little pile of crystallized white stuff is yeah. the sap of the tree that came out and mm -hmm. stopped the beetle. Okay. <coughs> so do you cut that off? You can cut that center hole, entire sunburned area off if you mm -hmm. want to deal with it. So the beetles are trying to get into that so area. So that would be the same beetle. Right. Okay. Well, there's a lot of beetles that like dead parts of trees. You know, there's a whole bunch of bark beetles that attack any dying stone fruit tree. And there's a whole bunch of bark beetles that attack all the dying forests in the mountains. So there's a lot of different beetles around the path. Well, you can set get, it on yeah, the branch? Yeah, just set it up there somehow. 
think she would speak up for two minutes. So, if it is going to come out of the rally, you should put it in the job and do anything with it, just put it like on the fence or whatever, and go out. Okay, let's see. Go over the variety. Well, pollination. When we talk about pollination. So, University of California has always told everybody to get an A and a B type. Um, it's that's number three. So to get the fruit set, by far the most important thing to get the flowers to make fruit is bees. And the honey is the main thing. Get the bees out there. Well, actually, bees aren't number one. They're number two. Number one is supposed to be temperature. If it's 80 degrees, they said you get fruit no matter what. Bees number two. Three is... Uh, a and a B type of avocado nearby is to cross pollinate, but uh, this to a homeowner is probably not worth it. So it always, and all the references still say, at least the California references. You go any other part of the world, they never talk about pollinating avocados. They're considered self-fertile trees. But in California, our our good researchers have told us you need an A and a B. Uh, but the orchard people who run the orchards tell me, don't listen to them. <laughs> That's what they tell me, don't listen to them. So uh, what they, so the University of California went back and did some more research on pollinating avocados. So they've done the research on the half, which is the main commercial variety, which is an A-type avocado, which means that the flowers are female in the morning, the same flower, and male, they switch sexes in the afternoon. <laughs> so the female part of the flower is the middle of the flower. So you have this flower here, and the little pistil in the center is the female. The morning, the female part is, is, is active. In the afternoon, the male portions, you'll see the little orange, golden dust forming on the end. The male pollen is ready in the afternoon. Now on the B-type avocados, and the main one they use in the orchards is Mutano. That's supposed to be the best pollinator for the past avocados. They are female in the afternoon, and that same flower becomes male the next morning. So that they're opposite the A types. So it's easier for the bees to go from the A to the Bs and get the pollen to the flowers that way. Um, now, no other country does this, so they had to prove that it works. So what they found out is that if you have a Zutano next to a house, right next to the house, can't be more than a few feet away, we're lucky. Uh, it'll improve the production by about 15%. But that means you've got to take out every ninth tree in your orchard and plant a Zutano. And if you figure out the statistics, you've taken out 12% of your orchard to increase production by another 3%. Yeah. And the orchard people tell me, it's not worth it. you got all the Sutano food, now you got to find some way to get rid of it. Well, Roca grows their seeds, or the rootstock from that. But otherwise, Sutano is totally <coughs> worthless fruit. It's not that bad, but it's certainly not good. It has a defect that it tends to have cracks at the bottom of fruit, so no one's going to buy this fruit with a crack in the bottom. It's considered a, a mediocre to fair quality fruit. It's actually, I'll eat them. I mean, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's not commercial quality at all, so they said, why even bother? And if you get the bees out of it by spring 20, you just get a load of fruit. You can't do anything with So. So they said, yeah, there's no reason to have the A and the B types. Now lately, they've brought out other B types that are actually ones that they can sell fruit from. So there's a new avocado they're called Surprise, which is the granddaughter of Hass, that is the B type, that they can actually sell as a Hass at their supermarket. So some of the orchards are putting Surprise in next to Hass. It gives them a little bit of different window. Surprise ripens about a month or so before Hass does. So the orchards, you know, if they plant half surprise, half Hass, they can uh, 
have food over a longer period. So surprise has some valid validity to be used as a pollinator. But I would just tell you spray your trees with honey. You don't have to worry about pollination, get plenty of fruit. Anyway, the first avocado that the was commercial was called Corte. That was right around 1900. And Corte is still considered one of the best, if not the best tasting avocado out there. The problem with Corte, and it is a beet type, is that it's a very unreliable producer. So there's no orchard that would even consider planting Corte anymore. What they noted in the porch orchards, and they never did figure out why this happens, 80% of the trees don't do much. 20% of the trees in the orchard are making all the fruit, and they haven't figured out why. Why 20% of the trees make all the fruit in that porch orchard, and 8% just sit there and do nothing. Now, when I was a kid, my, my parents in the 50s planted porches because that was the an avocado at that time. One tree produced fine, the other tree never produced a darn thing. So uh, I remember when, after when I was 15 years old, we moved away, that tree was made in one fruit. First fruit we'd ever seen on it, maybe that it removed. So Forte is not a reliable producer. Has became the tree to grow in the 1950s. And to this day, it is 80% of the world's crop is uh, avocado that is Hass. And it was discovered in your Belinda at the Hass Ranch in your Belinda. They're growing Forte's one of the seedlings that they're grafting the forte trees onto wouldn't accept the graft. It grew and we proved that the family liked, so we call it the Hass avocado. Brokaw was her neighbor. Brokaw made their fortune growing the Hass avocado trees for Hass and the surrounding orchards. Uh, they moved to Ventura after a while from uh, your Belinda. So that's how the orchard industry got started. Brokaw has facilities all around the world, Spain, South Africa, Australia, where they grow their trees. So they are now about the biggest out there. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm curious, because uh, I thought I had this really old interior fuerte. Every year is different. Some years it's a big producer, other years not much faster. Really kind of one fruit on the whole. It's a really good area. Is that true for other species? Or? Well, most of the new, most of the newer varieties, and the varieties we're trying to sell are more, more consistent producers. But one of the problems with Forte, one of the reasons why it's such an on-off tree is it, is it blooms uh, December, January, February. So a lot of years you get it. There's no bees out. It's too cold. Now lately it hasn't been that cold, but most years it blooms. It's in the middle of winter. So there's. You know, we had trouble in the, back in the 80s when we had winters, I was trying to grow Pinkerton. It was another December, January, February bloomer. So I like, I had like seven fruit in five years, and I went, well, this is, this doesn't work. So I pulled that one out and planted a Gwen instead. But uh, now they would work. And now we have summer and winter, so it's not so bad anymore. But in those days, I couldn't figure out how people can grow Pinkerton, because it blooms so early. The latest to bloom tends to be the most productive. Uh, let's go over it that one. So Forte blooms early. Uh, we don't recommend it though it's great fruit. Hass is a normal season bloomer, so this one's more like February, March, April. Now port now let's take a quick bloom. time on Hass is February to April. And now it's, it's different every year. This year was so off. You can't make that. And then the harvest period on that is uh, it's February through. This is the cheat sheet from the University of November. California does their avocado research in Irvine. So I get the cheat sheet from them. It's February through August is harvest. So the fruit's hanging on there at least a year before you pick it. One year at minimum. Now, avocados don't fall off the tree. That is, that you know they'll like the hash. You can pick it in February and you can it'll ripen fine. It'll start dropping off at the end of summer by itself. So uh, you know, the, the longer it's on the tree, the faster it ripens after you pick it. If you pick it much before February, it's pretty bad. It's 
rubbery instead of soft. We want to pick it sometime in that window, February to August. And it is on there an entire year. So you often have two crops on your tree every year. But Hass has a lot of offspring. So the University of California, what they did is they planted, I think it was back in the 60s, they planted 300 pits of Hass and evaluated all the babies. And out of that, they got a lot of offspring that were worth something. So I believe Gwen was in that group and the foot sold. These aren't sold too much anymore because they've got newer ones. But these are daughters of Cass. When March through September. And whistle. Uh, Same from March through September. And these are heavier producers than half, so they tend to stay shorter. Whistle proved to be too weak. I think Gwen, they've given up on too. Gwen, what Gwen tended to do that was bad is every winter in the avocado production production areas like Fallbrook, they would drop all the leaves and they'd have to whitewash them like crazy and keep from burning in the middle of winter. So Gwen's not growing that well. I mean, we sold Gwen last year because it is a good safety proof, heavy producer. Now, there's one we can't get currently, that's Jim. This is the one that they worked on. They said for 40 years, the University of California wanted to perfect the hats. So their perfect, perfected hats is called Jim. Uh, Ray Edward Martin named it after himself. That's his initials, Ray Edward Martin. Um, we sold it for about five years, then the University of California says, oh, you can't sell it to homeowners. So your tax money is gone to orchards only. We can't figure out what the reasoning is that they can't sell it to homeowners. Why? What, what's the reasoning? Why is it not? I don't know. Wait, Jim, if we're not allowed to sell, then they don't even probably put that on the list. Um, and then Surprise is another related one. Surprise, now, the avocados that we like generally are are the Guatemalan types. They tend to be higher in oil, uh, bigger fruit. The Mexican varieties tend to be a, a little different flavor. They're also pretty high in oil, but they're a little more anise or nutty flavored. And then the West Indian ones we don't work with. So these are mostly Guatemalan. Surprise is maybe half and half, a little more Mexican. So it ripens a little earlier. Because the Mexican variety is ripen uh, three or four months before the Guatemalans do. So surprise, March through July. That's what it says. It's not that much earlier. And the skin is kind of thin on it. It's thinner than uh, pass, but it's still being sold as a half. So if you go to a supermarket and you look at the avocados there, these are all there. They don't say, you know, that they're hats or not hats. This is the, the avocados that are being grown commercially. Um, is there a way of telling which fruit has been on there for six months to one has been on there for a year already? Size. Size. And the color does change. The main thing, one thing you'll see at the end of the fruit, there's a where the stem is attached, so it's kind of like a button. Where the stem is attached. Once that turns yellow, that fruit is ready to drop. It's still green, it, it still can stay on there longer. And once that thing turns yellow, it's about to, they call it cysts, and then it falls off. I noticed on mine that when they stop actually growing, they go from a, a shiny skin to a, a kind of a dull skin. Yeah. That's when I know that's as big as they're going to get. <laughs> Matter when you pick them? What time of day? You know? no, um, is it just wise to let them drop? No, no if they're on there that long, uh, they get to eat them real fast. Usually, the most avocados have a five month window where you can leave them on the tree. Same with citrus. You can leave them to pick for five months. There's a few that have, they have a shorter window than that, but a lot of these you can see the windows quite a, quite a bit, which is certainly good for a homeowner. 
when you mentioned Haas, is that uh, also uh, Kami Haas? Yes, you never mentioned that. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, a lot of the food at the store is this one called Carmen Haas. We don't have any of these right now. We'll hopefully have them next spring. So, Carmen Haas is just Carlos Mendez. So, this is named after Carlos Mendez. Found a Haas tree down in Mexico that was flowering three times a year except this the one time here. So that's better for the orchard guys to have more than one chance here to get fruit. So Rocon Nursery, who we get our trees from, is selling 200,000 plus Carmen Altavas every year to the orchards. They're replanting all the orchards to this. So a Nerger Hats Orchard in California gets about seven tons of fruit per acre per year. The Carmen Orchards in Mexico, 21 tons, or 27 tons, something like that, per acre per year. Now lately, because of the warmer winters, the houses in California have been getting around closer to 15 tons per acre per year, because we had more, more trees making food every year. But still, the Carmen is an incredible tree, so that this way you'll need one. Otherwise, if you had two or three avocados, you get food all year. Carmen, the Carmen still, the spring crop is its main crop. Um, the spring bloom is its main crop. But if you don't get a good spring crop, so if Carmen sets really heavily on the spring bloom, they won't bloom the rest of the year. They'll just grow uh, and ripen that fruit. But if they, the first set of flowers doesn't do anything, then they'll bloom heavily in August. And if that doesn't do anything, they'll bloom heavily in October. Is it better eating avocados? It's just a hex. Same thing. Same thing. Uh, it's interesting, though, each bloom period makes a different shaped fruit. Yes. So, like, on the winter fruits like Fuerte and Pinkton, they're long and X pear shaped. And the summer blooming, reeds around. Uh, the Carmen, whichever bloom it is, whatever time of year it is, is you get that shape. So the bloom in the summer, you get round fruit. Blooms in winter, you get pear shape. I'm sure there's little differences during the year. I mean, you know, you go to the store, the, every alcohol tastes different. Some people pick their trees too early, some leave them on there longer, so it depends when you pick it. And it depends on the weather that year, too. I mean, you know, the month the few weeks before they arrive probably makes the biggest difference on if it's sunny or not, uh, on the quality of the fruit. But Carmen, my, last year my Carmen tree, I wanted a box in my house, bloomed four times. <laughs> each, each time it bloomed and made fruit. So it's like, okay, uh, it's hard to beat that thing. If you only want one tree, Carmen's probably the one. Uh, now Carmen, we, were, we sold Carmen's for seven years and we're told, well, we're not supposed to sell them to you because homeowners aren't supposed to have this. This was their um, their agreement with Carlos Mendez. Don't sell them to homeowners. The patent on this thing ran out this year. Uh, we think we're going to get these next year. So we placed an order for 400 trees. We'll see if we get them. But uh, hopefully we'll get them. So homeowners are not supposed to get jam and not supposed to get farm. Yeah. Jem from University of California and Carmen from and Carlos Mendez. That was the agreement, supposedly. I mean, we every year we've been able to manage to find some Carmens around from other sources. One source went out of business the year, the year after we got them from them. I don't know if that was because they're selling something they weren't. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, but uh, we managed to pick up a few Carmens. We even had a few this year. Just a few, though. Uh, we have a tendency to forgetting string. Um, the avocado that we eat gets a little string. Well, there's an avocado they call lamb house. And lamb house, the uh, orchards like it because the fruit's bigger, and so it's more productive than river house, but it tends to have strings in the flesh. So I have a fuerte, but. Is there anything you can? I don't know what the, what conditions. I haven't read anything about what conditions make the strings. 
I heard once though it was if the fruits pick too early, but I'm not certain. Well, my wife thinks it's because we leave the fruit on the tree too long. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. But um, I was wondering if it's like not enough water or. Not that no, but I know lamb has. They said it's the stringiest of the avocado. So you get one from the supermarket and it's stringy. That's lamb has. Does that or has offspring? Thoughts on holidays in Charlotte? Uh, holiday is probably a has offspring, so I think it came out of that group, University of California and Irvine. And holiday is is the main one we're selling right now. So holiday is uh, one of these trees is holiday. So this is a pretty good avocado. Uh, fruit's bigger than a has. So has fruit. So the CUC that's stuck at the market generally is six to 14 ounces in size. Um, the holidays tend to be 18 to 30 ounces. So they get big and the tree stays small because it's a good producer. So, and this thing ripens uh, July through November. I thought I was supposed to cover all the major holidays, but it didn't quite make it to Christmas. Uh, but July through November is a good, you know, that's a good opposite season almost. And I've eaten the holiday. The, the guys at the research facility gave me some. They were big, thick skinned, kind of dark gray green. Uh, tasted like solid butter. They were quite good. It, it's not one of the top five, but the, the fruit they gave me was excellent. I mean, most of the varieties we sell are considered excellent fruit. Good to excellent. So. What this about, was one of the best fruits I've eaten. What about like Charwell? Well, I've eaten Charwell. I've eaten all their stuff over there they claim is the best, and there's not a whole lot of difference between the top ten. <laughs> really, I mean, you get a good Hass, that's about as good as you can get. But uh, Charwell, Jan Boy, they consider Jan Boyce to be the best one over there. I ate some and went, okay, good avocado. Nothing special. And nothing unique about the top. They all taste like avocados. Nothing that different. The holiday is certainly one we can get. We actually sold uh, Charles last year. Uh, couldn't get them this year. Uh, and when we buy from Brokaw, a lot of times what we're buying is the leftover from a big contract grow. So they have a big contract with an orchard to grow the, these trees. They'll grow. 2,000 of them. The contract say was for 2,000, they go 2,050. Just to make sure they have enough and we'll buy what's left over. But unless we're ordering that money, a lot of times they won't grow them for us. So we have the holiday. Now these are all, I would tell you, has like fruit. Where does the reed avocado fit in? Next page. <laughs> <laughs> so reed one of the best avocados you can grow also. Now we couldn't get any, we had a few reeds this year. We had contract grow 50 reeds from them last year. And then they found out that the deuce root stock they were growing them on wasn't legal, wasn't supposed to be sold to us either. So the University of California didn't control the root stock, so they had to take them back. And they gave us what they had left, which was only like five reeds on Coral Canyon. But reed is a large, it's almost brown. Um, the nice thing about reed is it blooms uh, March to June. So it's usually, it's usually dead last blooming. Uh, nothing else blooms that time, so no pollination possible much. But it sets very well and it ripens. Uh, now, reeds, I've eaten as early as January, they were fine, but here it says reeds, September, they like them September to December. Now, truthfully, I've never had a reed avocado last on my tree past July. I eat them all before July. Uh, but here they're saying leave them on September, so they're on there a year and a half after they bloom. But, uh, so I've eaten them in January, they're mediocre in January, by April they're pretty darn good. By June, they're excellent. So I usually eat them all by that time, but here they're saying leave them on September, December. A big fruit um, and heavy producer. Here they're saying uh, about 
about 18 ounces. A little over a pound is their size. They're like, they look like cannonballs, little cannonballs. Real thick skin, uh, high oil content, 19, 20%. Just about as high as you get on avocados. Yeah, the highest are right around 20%. I mean, we learned about reed from an orchard grower. He says, well, I grow half to sell, I grow reed to eat. Uh, reed is the second largest crop in California. It passes 90, 95% of reeds, about 10%. They said most of this goes either to restaurants or farmers markets. They like the bigger food, smaller seed. Uh, you get more meat in there. And it is quite good, but the um, window is a little bit smaller. Well, reeds go to a farmer's market summer you get reeds. They're, they're excellent. And they're also, uh, University of California says, three times as productive as has normally. And they said that's mainly because they never miss the year. Yes. Now sometimes the fruit gets uh, pretty dark on the outside, almost black. Is that sun or? It might be sunburning going on. Yeah. So but it is a nice thick skin. I mean, it's like Oscar did it on you just harvest it and eat it anyway? Yeah. Now, in the past, you know, I've never encouraged people to plant avocados in containers. Because to me, they're just two light producers. But a friend of mine was growing his reed avocado in a 24-inch box, which is this size container. And so we just said, okay, let's count the fruit on that tree, see how much he actually gets. He had 80 fruit on there. <laughs> I couldn't believe he had 80 fruit in a tree in a box. I thought, you know, five or ten would be all you can get in a 24 inch box since of how avocados produced, but he had 80 fruit in there. So now I said, okay, uh, you know, half a barrel or a box, that's not a bad size for growing avocados, especially to get the honey water and the flowers and getting, getting them produced heavily. But that reed was really productive for him. Uh, the other varieties that we're actually carrying, so we have holiday, we have hass, um, I do have a few Edinburgh. Well, there's Fuerte and Edinburgh. Fuerte was the big avocado in California in the 1900s, uh, to about 1950. Edinger, they took Fort to Israel, grew some of the seeds, and they got Edinger. Edinger seems to be a little bit better producer than Fort maybe not quite as good tasting, but still good, uh, but a better producer. So if you and the season's about the same. So if you like the Fortes, Edinger might be a decent substitute. They're both quote B type avocado breeds in the A type. Uh, Edinger. February through June, ripening period. And Forte is uh, January to July, so it's essentially the same. Here, if I've got like a, moved in the house with, a, with several avocado trees, I have no idea what kind they are. They're just figured out by when they when, when they, they blossom. Huh? Yeah, it's on the combination when they blossom when the fruit ripens, but it's hard. There's a lot of avocado trees out there just from the seed. Yeah. So, and you never know that. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. We also have bacon. Now, bacon come a long way. So, this thing says bacon, fair quality. Well, people who like bacon really like bacon. It's just that they had us picking at the wrong time. So, before. The books would always say November through March. We pick them in November, they're really bad. We pick them in January, they're really good. <laughs> so, so the, the picking time has changed now, it's January through March. So it's a shorter period, but waiting that till the right is, makes a big difference. Now they're quite good. Um, bright yellow flush, big fruits. Um, This is uh, Hass. This is Forte. This is 
supposed to be read. Bacon is kind of shaped like Fuerte because it's a winter bloomer. Smooth, thin skin. That's its fall. It's got thinner skin. It is dark green uh, and bright yellow, yellower than this. And if you close your eyes, you can you can kind of imagine the bacon flavor to it. It's, it's pretty darn good. You can pick it late in the year. So we're, we're, people are actually requesting bacon on cow trees in this one. Where in the old days, it was just a pollinator. And then the other one, uh, Jim Bacon is the guy who developed bacon. And then he made another one he called, named after his first name. There's one called Jim we also have. Next in November to January, but it's probably November uh, to January anyway. Higher oil content than the bacon. The 20% oil. So it's supposed to be a little better. Quality is still considered fairly good though. So there's the gym, and then we also have Mexico La Grande. varieties have more quilted foliage. It's not as shiny, and it's definitely more quilted looking. So, some of the, I think I have another one over there that has a lot of Mexican in it too, but they, uh, Jim and Bacon are mostly Mexican. So they have the more quilted foliage, but the true Mexicola, the skin on it is deep purple black, gorgeous skin, real thin though. Uh, and then the flesh is really strongly flavored. They have a totally I mean, it's, some people say anise, some people say extremely nutty flavor. But they're quite good. They do ripen early. Uh, it's not even on this list. The regular Mexico is, and it's November, December, so it's early. So you can get the regular Mexico, which is a small tree, small fruit, and then the Mexico Grande is more of a medium sized tree and larger fruit. Most of the year we cover with the varieties of avocados. So if you have some room in your yard and you, you know allow each one to get about eight foot wide or so, um, you get a good crop on something that size. So when you're talking about grafting, let's say you have a, a leaf and you want to have the same fruit, what is, do you have to graft it the same way to the graft to the weed, or you can do cost go into the leaf and get Leaf. Well, whatever branch it is will make it. It's, this is genetically a, a uh, Mexico La Grande, no matter if you draft onto another avocado or not. So it depends yeah. on that. Uh, yeah. Right. The rootstock can affect the fruit a little bit, but not usually that much in the way of flavor. It's usually going to affect size or shape sometimes, like. Um, on citrus, they know that the dwarf rootstocks usually make the fruit uh, instead of taller, flatter, and the skin thinner than the standard rootstocks. It's, but I don't know how the different rootstocks, I don't know that they've done a study on how the different rootstocks affect the fruit. Like on grapes, there are some grafted grapes out there, but the wine people notice that they can tell the difference between the wine made from a grafted grape and a grape grown on its own roots. So now they quit doing that because they said it affected the wine quality. <laughs> but you have to be pretty snobbish to be that particular about it, I think. <laughs> At what point does the avocado tree like that develop a wide diameter trunk to where it doesn't need supports? Is there anything you can do in the trunk? These guys are seeing it. They're developing the leaves and all that. If you look at a 20 year old avocado tree, yeah, they're huge. Huge. Sometimes you have to About five years to get a, a decent sized trunk on that. Uh, so, really, possible that it just overgrows too much and becomes too stiffly? Oh, yeah. Well, what avocado do a lot? So, when they're young, they're almost like vines. That's why I brought this one in. Yeah. 
Now, if this didn't have a stake on it, it'd just be laying on the ground because it's so skinny. So if I wanted to, I can take this one off the stake and stake this one up, and this will be the tree. Or if I cut the rest of the tree off, I can make this the trunk. So, you know, they're, when they're babies, you know, like Broca often leaves two or three trunks growing because the guy who's in the field have to figure out which one's going to be the main trunk. Is. Now, in most orchards, they don't want the trees very tall anymore. They want them as short as possible. So you see a um, Broca's orchard, and they don't have a straight trunk more than a, a foot or two. And then they go sideways. They just let the tree go sideways. They don't want it high climbing ladders is a no-no in, in orchards nowadays. So they don't, you know, that's why, you know, we don't really care anymore. Plants have straight trunks anymore because that's not what we want. And that's, you know, if you got a shade tree, you want a straight trunk. Or a metal tree, you want a straight trunk. But with the orchard trees, that's that can be not so not so good. So it's better to have just let it go sideways. So what, at what height would you let the first sides go? Foot up, two foot up, three foot up? Well, one foot's going to be too short because that, the way the root's going to bring it to the dirt. So two foot off the ground is good height. But I, when I look at their pictures on their website, they have branching starting at a foot on some of their trees. So, you know, the, but anyway, the, they have them skirted so they're about probably the foliage is this high off the ground. Really? So they're not like digging a hole and keeping it flat? They're kind of mounting? Uh, actually, when Brokaw recommends planting orchards, they recommend the farmer make a two-foot high berm and plant them on that berm to get them way above the grade. So if you have a slope like this, would you plant a, still do a berm when you come on the slope? Or? Probably not, but try to keep, make sure that they don't get buried by dirt coming down the slope. You don't want to change the grade on the plants roots if the ones that's there. Did this guy were in well, the bigger the pot, always the better. Well, there's a couple reasons. So, on black plastic, you have this in the sun. Whatever side the sun hits, you lose all the roots there because that plastic gets 120, 130 degrees. So, if it's a bigger pot and the roots are further away from the edge, it's better. Right. Same in the wintertime, it gets too cold. The bigger the pot, Right. Should be a pot only hurts if you're using the wrong potting soil and everything dies because the potting soil is so bad it kills it. Not necessarily, but yeah, you probably will. Now, there is a way you can push any plant, and we do that in the nursery a lot. So if you really want these things to grow, you know, by, by the time they'll bloom next spring, because these are already big enough to bloom, uh, they'll probably be about, when well, the ground anyway, they'd be about six, seven foot. So, but there are ways you can push them even faster. Um, and we do that all the time in the nursery. So I've often mentioned because people always ask, so we spray the plants with sugar. Uh, yeah. Uh, any form of sugar. And the marijuana growers figure this out a while ago, too. So the leaves are there to do photosynthesis, and the leaves make sure that's their main job. Um, plants are made out of cellulose, which is a re, all it is is a sugar molecule that's being rearranged so you can't eat it. I mean, bacteria can eat cellulose, but nothing else can. Um, Cows and uh, beavers, things that eat wood and plant material in order to digest cellulose, they have bacteria in the guts that can do it. So, cellulose is sugar though. So, most of the plant is made out of cellulose. If you want the darn thing to grow faster, you just apply sugar to it. So, we found out in the 1980s that plants actually absorb sugar through their leaves, which is kind of weird, but it works. So if you want a plant to grow fast, you spray sugar on it as often as you can, and it'll just take off. Uh, giant pumpkin people do that. They, they found out a long time ago, if you want to grow something bigger than 500 pounds, you got to spray it. you got to help it along. Uh, but so the sugar solution that we've used, now for most of our time we've done this, we've done this since the 80s, because we found out in the 80s it actually worked. We found out 
Um, this was in an article, California Ripper Growers saying that some people with citrus in, in fall verdes couldn't get their trees to get enough sunlight to bloom and fruit. So they spray them in sugar in the fall when the plants are storing energy to, for fruit production, which is a sugar solution that was actually molasses was in the original formula, and the trees would actually flower and fruit the next year. So we had a plum tree that was making about five plums per branch on the tree. So we just took that, that same sugar solution, used caro syrup instead of molasses, and sprayed one branch six times during the fall, every two. And the next year, that one branch had 25 plums. We're going, okay, that seems to work. <laughs> so we've been doing that in our plants ever since. If you spray them in spring or summer, they just grow faster. They're programmed to grow. If you spray them in fall and winter, is they're programmed to save that sugar for next spring's growth of the crop. So the formula that we've been using is one ounce of carol. has the other nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, things that make up the other parts of the plant cell. And then the seaweed is a powerful growth hormone, kicks them in the earth, gets them growing really fast. So you put all three in a sprayer and spray it on there, things grow like weeds. No, no water. dilution. I'm sorry, you don't have water? Oh, uh, sorry, one gallon of water. There you go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Otherwise you got some icky trees. <laughs> And we use table sugar instead of barrel syrup. Molasses, molasses brown. Uh, but it is amazing how fast things grow when you spray it on there. So but every two weeks you would do that? Uh, at nursery we do it every week, if not twice a week. Because we know if you want something to grow faster, or if something's having trouble, struggling, you spray it on there, or they recover. Because they're they have plants live off their, you know, plants need to. Uh, close a wound or grow new leaves, they're, they're working off their carbohydrate storage in their branches. So if you give them extra carbohydrates, you can get them to grow. I mean, the original formula was created by University, I think it was Ohio, because they had hardwood cuttings of trees that would start growing roots and not finish. And they noticed that the carbohydrate content of the branches had gotten too low, so they ran out of energy to make roots. So they would have, they made this formula to apply it to the cuttings to make a root there. Would that be effective for grafting? Probably. If there's something to spray on, you know, if it's a, a leafy graft. It doesn't work too well if there's no leaves. Any green part of the plant, though, apparently can absorb sugar. Tomatoes. Any plant you want. We spray our tomatoes. The, I, uh, on the ones that are going to drop their leaves, in the winter, you, you spray them just before they drop the leaves? Or? Well, sooner than that would be better. But, uh, you know, so most stone fruits stop growing with the first day of fall, they stop growing. The days get shorter than the nights, and they start storing energy at that time. So that's the best time to spray a stone oak tree. And I'm sure citrus store energy in the fall, too, for the spring bloom and, and fruit production. You wouldn't do this on these guys at this age, would you? Or would you? We do. Okay. We've been doing it. Because they're not producing fruit now, so you can see. Yeah, but they'll grow. They'll grow better. Yeah. I mean, all, this stuff is all growth stuff. As far as well, you know, the, if the plant is not making fruit, it'll just grow like a weed. You haven't made anything up for sale with all three in it, have you? No, it gets moldy pretty fast, so you have to use it right away. So we have the fish and the seaweed. There's one product on the shelf that the uh, pump growers used to use, Neptune's Harvest, they just combined the two. It was a combination of seaweed and, and fish. But uh, I don't know, we actually have a distributor now that picked up that brand again for a while we lost the brand. But we have the two components, and these buy sugar, carol syrup, molasses, table sugar, they all work. Any questions on the avocado? I think we covered everything else. What's the best time of year to shape an avocado tree? 
Doesn't matter. It's gotten um, too spindly. Yeah, right now, you know, the avocados are definitely tropical plants. They respond well to summer pruning. It's just that when you prune in summer, you've got to whitewash them to make sure they don't sunburn. Other than that, this is a great time to do it because you know, if you do it in winter, they're not programmed to grow at all when it's cool. So then it takes longer to get the foliage back. Right now, they're growing. I mean, when we got that burning, boy, did they recover. I couldn't believe how fast they recovered from that burn. <laughs> you, can't, you don't hardly see any of it now. I mean, when, when that thing happened that day, every top of every tree of ours was black. Every single tree. And when you look at it now, you can't even notice the damage. Anytime we get so much above 105, you're into uncharted territory. Is there anything you can do to help a tree during a heat spell? Water every minute. <laughs> That's an old book, or you know, that's a really old book because most orchards water daily, save money watering daily. We uh, figure out most plants, if you have a foot of soil that takes at least an inch of water to go through dry, a foot of, to wet the entire foot of soil, ours never look dry, so we don't put an inch of water, but we get close to that. We water these about an inch of water, then we know we'll wet the entire thing. You don't have enough water for that. Those trees, more than that depth, is totally worthless. 
So the smaller you keep your trees, the better. So as long as you maintain them, and that, that, that's the hard thing is maintaining that size and figure out how to do without sacrificing too much crop. Now in Japan, I was looking, someone sent me a video on, on how they do it in greenhouse in Japan because they can't grow them outside, it's too cold in winter. So in, in greenhouses, when they were low greenhouse, not too high, they were training all their trees, two branches only, in a V shape. And he getting fruit all along these branches. And that's how they train their trees. For their for their system of greenhouse growing, this was the best shape. But generally for most orchards, it would be a dome would be the ideal shape. And five foot across may be the ideal width, but you know, it might be difficult to keep an outcow that small. I mean that's why I said maybe eight by eight is a good size. So about uh, chunks eight ten feet apart. Yeah. Um, now, the tree, there's a tree at Great Park at Irvine that we planted back in 2007. It's Carmen House. So we were there three years ago counting fruit on that tree. And uh, the bottom branch, which is about this long, has 50 fruit. We're going to have a lot of fruit. <laughs> one, 50 fruit on one branch. That was wow. pretty amazing. So they can produce pretty heavily in a small spot. Is that the tree that's in the park? Yeah. Okay. That thing, that thing's really productive. So. And so, when you plant the soil, what do you, what do you, um, what you then soil when you actually plant it? You say you buy one of these, you dig your hole. How much regular dirt versus amendments do you put in, and how much do you mound it? Well, if your soil is decent soil, so Santa Ana, most of orange on flat ground here, or left part of the ground, Pestons. Uh, Irvine North and Five, Garden Grove, this Anaheim soil is perfect. Don't do anything to spin around. If you're on the slopes and you get into the clay soil, then make sure that it's got, you know, if it's on the slope, it's got good drainage. Uh, if you're on flat clay like Fountain Valley, then build it up, make it half sand. I mean, our potting soil will work. That's what these things are growing in, but sand is cheap. Uh, or decomposed granite, or sandy loam. And it's a good sandy, Really draining soil so the water doesn't sit there. Can you mix it with the native soil and drop it in? You could do that. Yeah. As long as it drains well. So, uh, you know, the, the danger is that the water sits there for three days or more, or two, three, at least two days. It just sits there and sits there. What happens is the water is not the problem, is that, that the, water, the same water is sitting there and the roots are using up the oxygen, the oxygen level drops, and then the roots start suffocating and getting rotten. The water moves, then water doesn't hurt at all because out of the tap, the water is full of oxygen. Right. So there's no there's no issue with lots of water unless it just sits there. We have a fuerte that we planted probably five or six years ago, so it's a pretty good sized tree now. It blooms. It has the activity in the spring, and we'll even see little tiny fruit setting, but we have yet to see an avocado on it. It's, uh, of all your suggestions, um, what would you say we should do at this point? Well, spray honey on the trees in the spring to make them get more fruit set. And then you can spray sugar on them all, all spring and summer to see if you can power up that tree to get the fruit. So what they've done on Fuerte Orchard because to get the trees to produce more fruit is to curl the branches. And what I mean by that, it'll take big branches on the tree you know, that are at least this size or bigger. And they'll girdle them, they'll strip off all the bark. Gap about a half inch. And what that does, it locks the sugar up in that branch so it can't go anywhere. So what the plants do is they make sugar in the leaves to keep the roots happy and alive. The tree sends a lot of that sugar down to keep the bark of the tree to the roots. The water and the fertilizer flow to the center of the tree, and the sugar goes down the bark of the tree. You knock off the bark, the sugar is locked up into that branch, and, and then the tree makes more fruit. So they found on the fuerte, if you girdle the branch, and I think they said November, I have a handbook somewhere, do it in November, it actually delays the bloom on that branch too, by about a month or two, which brings it more in the spring when it's better anyway. And then that branch generally makes more fruit than if they don't gurgle the branch. Uh, now, spring.
spraying sugar on the branch will do the same thing as turtling it, but it won't delay the bloom or How would you do that? Pet it with a pocket knife? Yeah, they have a special tool that they make out of sheet metal that's a kind of a loop, kind of this shape, and they just girdle the bark off for half an inch. They want it only half inch so the bark will reclose within a year, and then roots get fed. So the way Brokaw grows their trees, you go into their farm in Ventura, all their trees are sitting on a raised bed of screen so they have good drainage. And, they, and the trees are all set container to container in double rows. So the only way the tree can grow is one direction. So, yeah, so the trees are just growing that way. Because there, there's a tree right behind them and right next to them on both sides. I mean, this but tree... So yeah, I mean, all they want is a good two foot of straight trunk, and that's all they're interested in. Beyond that, the tree will regrow in all directions. Yeah, and their nursery, they're sitting at real tight. You know, so they can only grow that way, <laughs> up and that in one direction. I mean, usually when you get them from when they're younger, and they're not so one way yet, but this was sitting in their nursery for at least a year, beyond the normal selling season. So they're way one way now. Still, you know, you just cut these branches back a bit, they'll leave them out. Okay. On our nursery, the avocado trees are right outside this wall. And, well, they, if you're interested in these, they're against the back wall. The, uh, the Brokaw uh, mm -hmm. home trees. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.